By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And also, welcome back to Paladins of the North, because we're back at this tournament held in Groningen. We have reached round number three, and in round number three, we are looking at a trolling hippies deck taking on the blue bots and the trolling hippies player is called Gijsbert and he's taking on Frederik and he's playing with the blue bots. Now before I start with the deck deck, before I jump into that section of the video, I would just like to point out that as always you can also skip that section if you want to and go straight to the action. The easiest way to do that is by checking the description below. There you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG games. If you click on there you can go straight to the games. Also, the description below is quite handy if you want to know more about the specific rules of this format. Uh, at the Paladins of the North Cup, we are playing according to the Swedish rules and uh, banned and restricted list, but with a pretty open reprint policy. Okay, so um, I guess that means that we're now ready to jump into the deck decks. I think I'm going to start with the deck of Gijsbert Trolling Hippies. Here we go. And here we see the deck of Gijsbert, so trolling hippies and obviously I gave it that name because of the four set trolls and the four hypnotic specters. And when I'm looking at this deck photo, beautiful deck photo by the way, stunning collection here. But what I'm missing, the first thing I'm missing, because that's what I think about, I'm missing something, those are the Nevenerals discs. And I kind of like this approach by Gijsbert, of course we, we've seen it before, it's not new, but you don't have to combine the Setch Troll with an Evernerals Disc. Yes, Troll Disco is a thing. Yes, it's a pretty good deck, but that doesn't mean that whenever you play Setch Troll, that Evernerals Disc is an auto-include. And when I'm looking at this list from Gijsbert, I think what he's done here is he's chosen for white over Evernerals Disc. You know, Evernerals Disc eventually does uh, with the wipe uh, effect, what Disenchant and Swords do together, right? So if you've got Disenchant and Swords to plow here, maybe it's better, it's cheaper. You know, Set Troll is pretty cheap to cast, Hippie is pretty cheap to cast. You've got some Moxins, you can kind of accelerate, you can put some pressure on. You've got those three sinkholes for the tempo game. So yeah, I kind of like it. Um, for the rest of the deck, when I'm kind of looking at this deck, I think, okay, you take a color, let's say blue, and you just put the best cards in of that color, right? I mean, you look at that. We've got Ancestral Recall, Time Walk, Brain Geyser, and Recall. Uh, I mean, especially for white, we see that, that control package with balance, disenchant, and swords. Uh, when we're looking at red, besides the set trolls, we see, you know, three bolts for some direct damage. Fireball can be a great finisher. Um, and of course, we see one badass creature, two badass creatures actually in this deck, and they are the Sheevan Dragon and the Juzam Jin. I mean, I think it's super cool, Gijsbert, that you're playing with those creatures, and I'm so hoping that you get to play them out, especially the Sheevan Dragon, a beautiful black-bordered beta one, I believe. I mean, I'm just hoping that you get to cast it. It is such a beauty. And then there are two other creatures that I kind of want to talk about for a moment. Those are the two vampires in this deck. I mean, Sengir Vampire is such a classical card. It's 4-4 Flyer, right? And when it gobbles up a creature, when it eats up a creature, it gets a plus one, plus one counter. And I think as a community, as an old school community, we should kind of think of a price. Like if you succeed to get a plus one, plus one counter on your Sengi Vampire at a tournament, I think you should get at least a beer. Maybe maybe your opponent should buy you lunch or something. Let me know in the comments below what you think should happen when, uh, when you manage to get a plus one, plus one counter on your Sengi Vampire. Because it's something that it's just really really difficult and and is hardly ever done so i think it needs kind of an incentive let me know in the comments below overall uh just to get back to the deck as a whole i think this is a very strong deck again i'm hoping that i'm going to see that chivan but i think your opponent Frederick is going to have a hard time talking about that let's take a look at his deck blue bots and here we see the deck of Frederick. so i've called it blue bots because obviously there there's blue in here and we see a full play set of suchis we see two trikes, we see some copy artifacts, some IC. So there's some artifact presence here, some robot presence, and of course a lot of blue as well, hence the name Blue Bots. Now there is something interesting going on here, and those are actually the four flying man we see right at the top there. And the reason I'm saying it's interesting because usually flying man, you only see them in a very aggro strategy. This deck is definitely more mid-range. I would say four mana is the sweet spot of this deck. You know, with four mana, he can cast Ghost Ship, he can cast Suchi, he can start casting uh, his control magic, his, his clones, his ice manipulators, um, as well as of course his psionic blast, which are a mana cheaper, one blue and two to cast. And just looking looking at this whole deck, I think I kind of know why Frederick chose Flying Man. And correct me if I'm wrong here, Frederick, when you're watching this video, but I think what you want to do is usually with this deck, you're just going to say island and go, right? Because there are no mocks and 
Um, there's not really a turn one play except for the soaring, and you've kind of fixed that problem by adding Flying Man, you know? So putting Flying Man in here gives you the ability to have a turn one play and also kind of give wrong information to your opponent because your opponent will probably think, hey, there's a Flying Man. You're probably playing aggro blue, right? We see those decks a lot. Fun decks to play with, by the way. But uh, so your opponent is, is very likely to just throw a Lightning Bolt to your flying man, which is which is great. It's like it, it eats a bolt for one blue. I mean, that, that's a pretty good deal. Um, and I guess what, just what I just said, you want to go to that four mana as fast as possible. You're going to ramp up with your Felwer Stones. You also got that one Soaring in there. What's also interesting in this deck is the mana short, the one mana short. I really, really like it. I think mana short is, some people say it's the poor man's time walk. I say it's the stylish time walk. I think it's super cool. It's beautiful art. And I kind of like it here as a one-off because it's always a surprise. So if you time it right, it's fantastic. I also love decks build around mana short, like with, with Psychic Venom and Winter Orb and cards like that. But uh, yeah, I just think this is this is really cool. I like one-offs because it means that you kind of have a surprise factor. And it's also quite interesting to play with decks with a lot of one-offs because you have a lot of different lines in your deck. Um, there's not one other thing I'd like to talk about, and that is the one control magic versus the four psionic blasts. I think you've really made a decision here, right? You're saying, okay, if need be, I can just burn you out. I can just use my Psyone Blast to kill you if I've done some early damage with, for example, my Flying Man. And then later on in the game, I'm going to cast a Trike. That's three more damage. Then I've got a lot of Psyone Blast damage. So you actually don't have to deal that many points of damage to, to kill your opponent because you're playing with those Psyone Blasts and Triskelions. On the other hand, when you're playing against a creature heavy deck like you're playing against today, I think those Psyonic Blasts are going to be very handy. Uh, we just see one control magic and it's, it's kind of interesting, right? Because um, you also could have made the decision, I'm going to go for two control magics and three Psyonic Blasts or three control magics and two Psyonic Blasts. I personally really like uh, like it when I can play a control magic and uh, support it with counter magic because that's basically a two for one. Um, but I also kind of see this decision that you've made that, okay, it's a mana cheaper, it's instant speed. I don't have to worry about disenchant or whatnot. I can solve a problem and if need be, or if, if it's convenient for me, I can also just play it directly on my opponent. It gives you some possibilities. The thing is what I've had with Psionic Blast a few times is that I'm too low to kind of cast my Psionic Blast safely. And I think that's also a risk against uh, the deck that you're playing uh, against today, the deck of Geisbert, because there is power in the deck. There are Moxen, there are those Sedge Trolls and Hippies. If you can just get those creatures out quickly, deal some early damage, you know, those Psionic Blasts can end up turning against you. And you also have to keep in mind, of course, that Geisbert is playing with Bolts and with the Fireball. So yeah, it's going to be interesting from that perspective. Uh, talking about uh, power, this deck is completely powerless. And I think therefore, Geisbert for me is a favorite in this matchup. I'm not saying that uh, you don't have a chance, Frederick. I think you very much do. But just looking at the two decks and looking at the weapons that Geisbert has, I think Geisbert is a favorite here. But I mean... We don't know how it ends up until we see it. Talking about that, uh, we've talked about the deck of Frederick. We already talked about the deck of Gijsbert. And that means we're ready for round number three of the Pelins of the North Cup. Here we go. Game number one on the left side, we have Frederick, the Blue Bots player. And on the right side, we have Gijsbert playing with his trolling hippies deck. And uh, there we saw a mulligan from Frederick here. He's on the play, starting with a flying man. And that means some early pressure here. And I wonder if we're going to see a bolt from Gijsbert. Ooh, Library of Alexandria. Oh, man. That is a tough start here for Frederik. Also, because he's playing blue, he doesn't have a lot of weapons against lands. I think actually zero uh, in this deck. Well, that's not true. He's got, of course, a Strip Mine and a Chaos Orb. And we also see a Mox Ruby here by Gijsbert. And then, of course, a Pass Turn with seven in hand. Oh, there's the Strip Mine. I'm actually happy we're seeing this. I was afraid of uh, getting into a non-game here. There we see the attack with the Flying Man. Gijsbert dropping to 19. So uh, Fredrik found one of his two answers. And let's see what uh, Gijsbert can do here. A little bit in the tank now. Going through his hand. Is that a land that he's putting there in front of his hand? Maybe he's thinking about taking care of putting a bolt on the Flying Man, but I don't think so, or else he would have done it already. There's an Underground Sea tapping two, and there's a Demonic Tutor. Okay, wow. 
So a great uh, opening hand so far here for Geisbert. You know, finding that Library of Alexandria, now playing the Demonic Tutor. Is he going to just tutor for an Ancestral Recall, just drawing three cards? Probably is. Another option could be a Mind Twist. Or perhaps something that goes well with his hand. Maybe playing out a big creature quickly with a Black Lotus, for example. But usually, usually they go for the Ancestral Recall, which is understandable. I mean, one blue for uh, for uh, three cards is just insane power. There's a Mox Pearl. So Gijsbert is, uh, is not stopping yet. Now he is. He's past turn here to Frederik. And he's going to have a look. There is a second blue. So at least now he's got Counter Magic open. I think if I would have a counter spell exactly, I would just pass turn because remember, Gijsbert just tutored for a card. That's probably a good one, right? And you probably want to counter that one. And now it's, of course, up to Gijsbert to try to find a hole in the defense of the counter player. Playing a City of Brass here. So four mana tapping. Are we going to see a Setch Troll here? Taking a damage, by the way. No, we're going to see a Hypnotic Spectre. So he's going to drop here to 17. There we see the counter spell. And he's going to counter the Hypnotic Spectre. I think that's a good decision. Also, looking at the mana base of Gijsbert, he only had one wide open. And, um, you know, he's countered the Hippie. And also, uh, he's opened the way here for the uh, for the Flying Man. So I'm a little bit surprised about this uh, this uh, Felwer Stone here. Because now he's giving Gijsbert the possibility to cast the potential Ancestral Recall. If that is the card that he looked up, of course. Oh, cool. There's a Juzam Jin. I hope you looked that card up, by the way. Because then you deserve points, my man. Fantastic to see this creature on the board. So a 5-5, five, five, and this is of course a problem. I wonder if Frederick has a control magic. That would be fantastic right now. Of course, he's still on 20. He can take a damage. He's going to attack Gijsbert here. He's going to drop to 15. And there is a Suchi. Okay, this is actually pretty good as well. Because if Gijsbert now attacks, um, you know, it means that Frederick can swing in for 5 on the swing back. And again, Frederick is stepping out, which makes sense because he's kind of under pressure because of that Juzam Jin. There we see a Mishra's Factory. And I wonder what he's going to do. Tapping two. And there is a quick disenchant. Yeah, that's of course the problem with the Suchi when you're playing against white. You've got swords, you've got disenchant to worry about. So it usually dies fairly quickly. And Frederick dropping to 15, by the way, after that attack by the Juzam. There's an untap. So I actually do think that Gijsbert looked up the Juzam Jin, which is super cool. Let me know in the comments below, Gijsbert, if you're watching this, uh, what cards you looked up with your Demonic Tutor. We'd love to know. There's the attack with the Flying Man. Gijsbert dropping to 13. But of course, the problem with Juzam Jin is still on the table. Now remember, the side Blasts are not going to help. There we see a Ghost Ship. Okay, so that Ghost Ship could potentially be a blocker for the Juzam. But we see a Quick Swords to Plowshares. Which is actually not too bad because it's buying Frederick a turn. It could be worse. He's on 17. That means he's now again on a four turn clock. And of course, Gijsbert keeps taking hits from his own Juzam as well. I mean, the best thing for Frederick here would be a Maze of Death. There we see the attack. So uh, Frederick's going to 12. And Gijsbert now has enough mana to cast his, uh, his Beta Shivan Dragon. Instead, we're going to see a Brain Geyser. Great card. He's going to draw three here. Keeping one mana open. And there is a Mox Sapphire and a Pass Turn. So both players are on 12 at the moment. And let's see what uh, Frederick can do here. Going through the cards, just attacking again. Gijsbert dropping to 11. There's another Flying Man. Okay. That kind of works. He can now deal 2 damage a turn. Gijsbert dropping to 10. I mean, if you're Gijsbert, you're kind of... If he could find his one Fireball, I mean, he could just take out both Flying Men with one Fireball. That would be ideal for him. I mean, he could also play it on Frederick, of course, but it's way more fun to just target two flying men when you can. Anyway, there's the attack. No, there's not. He's 
contemplating maybe he wants to do something before combat because I do assume you want to attack it with the Juzan. He can also, of course, animate the factory attack with both. That would be seven points of damage. It actually would be a pretty good option. Kind of trying to force Fnatic to make a block here. There is... Oh, he's doing the fireball play. Loving it. I really like this. No counter spell from Fnatic. And that means he's open. So he's going to have an attack for seven. He's going to drop to five. I think this fireball is pretty decisive. And I remember back in the day, we used to play without direct damage. You could only play your direct damage on creatures. And, uh, you know, that was just the way it went. You had different rules in different game stores. Like, I remember a game store where you could attack with walls because they just thought walls were cool. So you never kind of knew what kind of rule set you were playing. It was, it was really hysterical. And there we see a side Blast. I think this is a good decision. So he's going to take two from his side, five from the Jin. And he's going to drop to five. Ooh, is this the end here of Fredrik? He needs a solution like a maze or... Okay, Flying Man, that's not with Chum Blocker. At least it's something. It's buying him a turn. Kaisberg dropping here to nine. Let's see what he can do. I'm still hoping that he is now just going to cast a Sheevan just because he can. That would be great. Tapping three. Are we going to see a Satch or a Hypnotic Spectre here? Oh, we're going to see a Recall. What is he going to Recall? Probably the Brain guys here. Taking away the balance. Yeah, okay. The Fireball, of course. Yeah, that's a better play. <laughs> oh, I'm such a bad Magic player. Of course the Fireball. Taking care of the Flying Man. Killing in style, the Juice Am Jin winning this game. I mean, I'm just a fan of these big, iconic creatures. I can't help it. I think it's great. Geisbert, well done. And uh, yeah, also Friedrich, I think that, that fireball on, on both your flying men, that kind of was, uh, was the end for you in game one. But the good news is we still have more games to come between these two players. They're now going to go to their sideboards and we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two, here we go. So we've got Frederik again on the play after losing that first game. And it looks like he's going to keep his hand. No mulligan for him. Remember, he took a mulligan on game one. So at least now he can start with a fresh seven. Again, a flying man on his uh, first turn. So that's some early pressure. Let's see if Gijsbert can find a red source and a bolt if he wants to. And uh, as you can see, Fredek hasn't put his dice back yet. Hopefully he's going to do that later in the game. So he's on 20, just to clarify. So is his opponent, Gijsbert, who's now going to drop to 19, by the way. And the City of Brass is kind of nice as well. Two blue open for Fredek. You're ahead on board. You're the blue player. Just pass. Exactly. <laughs> That's what you got to do, man, when you're ahead on board. Uh, keep your counter magic open. There we see uh, a scrubland and a pass. So no action here yet from Gijsbert. And it's really good news for Fredek. He can find another island. If he's got a Felwer Stone, he can actually play it out because he can make any color with that, that City of Brass at the side of Gijsbert. But he's just passing for now. So Gijsbert on 18. Frederick still on 20, putting back the dice now. That's great. And we're going to see something. We're going to see a sinkhole. And yep, he's just letting it go. I think that's a good decision. You want to have two blue, so he still has two blue. And you want to keep your counter spell for other stuff. I mean... Could be that uh, Gijsbert is luring out the counter spell here. That's at least what I would do if I were him. So now he's going to drop to 17 and a pass. So the nice thing is, if you can just deal a lot of early damage, the City of Brasses are going to be harder and harder to use for Gijsbert as well. Here we see a Mishra's Factory and a Hypnotic Spectre. Let's see if we're going to see a counter spell here. There we go, a counter spell on the Hypnotic Spectre, but from the sideboard, a Red Elemental Blast negating that counter spell. Gijsbert on 16, but this is bad news for Frederik. Now he's got to deal with that hippie. Now, of course, he does have four psionic blasts in hand. I wonder what he's going to do. Can he find a land drop? Yes, he can. Okay, that's at least good news. Going to tap four. There we see a control magic. Gijsbert uh, has no answer yet, but of course, next turn he can untap if he has a disenchant. But at least for now, it means one point of damage in the back for Frederik. And uh, he's, you know, he's giving Gijsbert a problem. You deal with it, whatever. Let's see if he can. 
I'm expecting a disenchant here. Ooh, untapping it again, choosing different mana to cast it. There is that disenchant, yeah. And this is of course a problem when there's a little bit of pressure as a blue player. You've got to play your control magic without counter backup. Which is always kind of difficult. And actually power is really helpful with that. Like if you just have a, a, a Mox Sapphire that's an extra mana that can sometimes make the difference. Or if you have, of course, a Black Lotus and you can always counter. Just have an untapped Black Lotus on the field and you're good to go. So now Frederick staring down at the Hippie again. There is a Maze of If. There is a Suchi, okay. So, so far, Frederick is finding the answers that he needs. There we see a Swords to Plowshare, so that means he's gonna go up to 24. And of course, the Swords out of the game. There we see a Chaos Orb. Is he gonna flip? Probably gonna flip here on the Maze of If. Ooh, and this is gonna be a big flip. If he hits, it means Geisbert can start attacking with the Hypnotic Spectre, and I wonder if he's then going to jump, but first to flip. Is he going to hit it? Yes, he's going to hit it. Too much experience to miss here. Pretty clean flip. He's going to attack, and now it's up to Frederick to decide, do I want to protect my hand, or am I going to take the damage? And discard a card. The discard a card thing, of course, is the main issue here for Frederick. You can kind of see him doubt here. I believe he's got two cards in hand still, flicking through the cards. He is making the block. And uh, one of the most annoying things here is for Fredrik, what if those two cards are two counter spells? You know, that's a problem. Yeah, there we see the side blast. He's gonna drop to 22. At least he's got rid, he's gotten rid of the Hypnotic Spectre. Tapping five, are we gonna see a Sengir Vampire? There's the Vampire, Geisper taking a damage from his own City of Brass. And Fredrik now has to go and look for answers. I wonder if he boarded in extra control magics against Geisbert. That's definitely something I would have done, because his deck is very creature heavy. There we see a Dandan. Oh, I'm liking this. Coming from the sideboard, 4-1 Arabian Knights can only attack if your opponent has an island in play, and uh, his opponent does. Geisbert also playing with blue. So this is quite nice, because this is actually a little bit of a problem for Geisbert. Not a big one. But it's something to keep in mind, you know, there are four, potentially four points of damage there staring at me in the form of the giant fish. Oh, the fireball again, that's too bad. No counter magic from uh, from Fledrik. Too bad, I, I mean Dandan is such a cool creature, we're gonna see an attack for six here. And are we gonna see a side blast? No, we're not, so I guess that means he doesn't have it, he's gonna drop to 16. Two cards in hand, again the mace, so that's pretty good news, and a Suchi. And I have to say, you know, Fredrik is after sideboarding, he's finding the right cards, he's got the right answers. He's on 16, Geisbert's on 13. Let's see what uh, Geisbert can do now in his turn. There is a Mox Pearl. Tapping three, and there's a set troll. I think this is the first set troll that we've seen so far, even though he's playing with uh, four. Set troll, of course, being a very good creature here. For now, by the way, uh, Geisberg doesn't have red open, so this is a little opener here to attack. I think maybe I would have attacked here, and I do understand that, of course, then Geisberg can, can attack back, but. He had no red open, so there was a little opener there. There is the Badlands. And of course, I mean, he had no... Oh, he did have black open, by the way. Sorry, it's of course one black to regenerate. Nope. Forget about that. There was no opening. Cassette Troll is one black to regenerate. There we see a copy artifact on the Suchi. So at least two four fours and a pass turn. So if Geisbert is going to attack with the Juzam, um, Fredrik can just double block and, put, and then just trading one Suchi for a Juzam, which is not a great deal. We do see an attacker with both. I wonder if he's going to double block. The risk here, of course, is that perhaps Geisbert has a disenchant for that other Suchi or a Swords, and then he's going to lose both. I do think it's kind of worth the risk, but it's hard. 
And I know that some players are really good at reading opponents' faces and kind of knowing what that card is that they have in hand. And he's not taking the risk here. He's taking four points of damage, dropping to 12, tapping six, Shivan Dragon! And I have to say, Gijsbert, I'm a little disappointed. I saw this beautiful beta Shivan on your deck photo. But hey, I also love revised. I love I love a Shivan, whatever. I don't I don't care what printing it is. But I mean, you know, the blackboard one is kind of beautiful. But I do understand that when you go to tournaments, I get it, I get it. Anyway, but a Shivan Dragon, whatever form it has, it's always beautiful to see. And this is a big problem here for, for Frederick now. Because he's staring down at a Juzam, a Shivan Dragon, and a Sengir Vampire. And of course, that's Sedge Troll, but it's just small compared to those other big creatures. I mean, this is pretty big. Ooh, Demonic Tutor to make matters worse. I think this is Exit Frederick. I, I can't really see how he can win this. His hand's empty. He only has that one maze. Okay, he's got two Suchis, but yeah, who cares? He's gonna take his time. Yeah, he's gonna, of course, take care of the maze with the straight line. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And then he can fly over, deal 9 points of damage, 10, 11 points of damage. Because he can pump the Sheevan. This is, yeah, this is over. This is like... Probably has one more turn to go. So it's not completely over yet, but as good as over. So he's going to take 10 points of damage, going to go to 2. And he's going to pass turn. Let's see, can Fredrik find something here? No, because he's just passing. He needed like, he needed a control magic. But then even then, because the two flyers were tapped, even then that's not going to work. There's the attack for nine. And that's it, an island. I mean, island is really good. It's a really good card, but not in this situation. I'm sorry, Frederick. Anyway, that is it. That is the game and that is the match. 0-2 for the uh, trolling hippies player. And uh, both players are now going to show what they've uh, boarded, uh, boarded in after that game one. I have to say, Fredrik, your deck made a much better impression in, uh, in game number two. So we see that Maze of If, we see the Dandan, we see some Control Magics. So I think that's a very good decision because you were playing against a creature-heavy deck. And uh, of course, there we see the Red Elemental Blasts on the side of uh, Gijsbert. And the thing is with, with Red Elemental Blast, they're just really, really good when you're playing against the Mono Blue deck and you're forcing the Mono Blue player to usually put in the Blue Blasts. Uh, but I guess that Fledig didn't do that in this case. But um, I'm kind of liking the way Fledig boarded here, going heavy on the Control Magics, which, which makes sense with this matchup, and also putting in those Dandans. That, that's kind of nice, you know. I mean, Gijsbert's only playing with one Fireball, so that's pretty good. And also Maze of If is, is really good against... Uh, the deck of, uh, of Gijsbert. Anyway, um, this was the match. Thank you very much for watching and uh, keep an eye on the channel for more games that are coming up from the Paladins of the North Cup. Talking about games coming up, we're going to look at these two decks on Tuesday. That's when the new game video will be released. And again, this is from the Paladins of the North Cup. This is round number four. And it's gonna be super interesting because we're gonna watch Stevo and he's a player on the Bolt and Friends deck. And he's playing against Dion. D and he's playing with the core deck and uh, it's quite interesting both players are playing with the same colors and a lot of cards overlap but you know um, Dion only plays with core set cards only with alpha beta and uh, yeah his uh, his buddy Stebo that he's taking uh, taking it up against is also playing with cards from the four horsemen sets we see some city of brasses there some mistress factories by the way look at the <laughs> look at the deck photo let me just zoom in here to show you the whole deck this is insane. I mean, Stebo, what a collection you have. Look at that, those miscuts. Uh, wow. Very, very interesting. Uh, very interesting to look at. Also see that one black card. I guess it's a mind twist, the, uh, the altar there. Super interesting. But um, yeah, I mean, these decks are going to go head to head on Tuesday. You don't want to miss this. So make sure you, uh, if you're new to the channel, welcome to subscribe and ring that bell. I mean, you don't want to miss this. Um, and uh, if you're already subscribed, thank you very much because you are helping uh, Timmy Talks moving forward. There are a few other things that you can do. There are three things that are completely free and really help the channel out. That is, of course, liking this video. If you haven't done that yet, click on that thumbs up video. It really helps a lot. Uh, sorry, thumbs up icon. 
Anyway, um, you can also comment, of course, on this video. What do you think is a good price when you manage to get a plus one plus one counter on a Saint Gear Vampire? Let me know in the comments below. And then, of course, the last thing that you can do is share this video on your socials. All these things are free and they're quite easy to do, but they really help me and they help Timmy Talks move forward. Talking about helping the channel, there's one last thing that you can do, and that is becoming a patron of the show via Patreon. And there's probably a link popping up right now that will go, take you to an info card, I should say, and that will take you to the Timmy Talks Patreon page where you will find all the ins and outs and you can find out how you can support me. It's actually quite simple. It already starts with just $1 a month. And uh, with that money, you help me keep making videos for you guys. So if you appreciate what you're doing, yeah, you can support me via Patreon. And the cool thing is there are some perks there. It's not just that you're giving me something, which I really appreciate, but there are also some perks. Uh, for example, you get to join the Timmy Talks Discord and you get to join the Timmy Talks online events. And last but not least, your name will be mentioned in the end scroll. What end scroll? Well, this end scroll. Let's take a look at our fantastic Wunderbar patrons and channel members of Timmy Talks. Here we go. Somebody can see.